Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Mike Force Podcast. It is, of course, me, Mike G. What's up, guys? So, if you're tracking us on the YouTubes, um, right now, uh, you'll notice that I got this dumb headset on. I broke my Bose speakers uh, traveling. Just got back from a whole bunch of traveling. Had some real good times. I've been super busy. Um, and getting back to the grind now, and it don't stop. Uh, GBRS is in town. Big shout out to DJ and Cole. So is John Stryker Meyer. As we speak, my assistant's picking up John Stryker Meyer from the airport. So I got a Mac V SOG, couple Navy SEALs in town, going to do a whole bunch of content. And then I'm off to Texas. I'm going to do a TV show with Travis Pastrana, JT, the, the crew from Black Rifle. Um, it's going to be fun, man. Bucky Lasik, Dave from Rally Ready. It's going to be awesome. I, I am privileged, uh, Asian privileged, to be part of this whole experience, including my journey into rally racing and motorsports. Uh, I'll be racing in the ARA series, American Rally Association series. We haven't determined kind of uh, how I'm going to start that, whether it's naturally aspirated or turbo restricted, but it certainly is not going to be a pro car. I'm going to be in something um, a little bit more mild, let's just say. And, and, and that's how it should be, right? I need to learn the ropes. I need to understand code driving and navigation and all these pretty complex things. This stuff's not easy, but I'm super excited that I have the opportunity and I'm willing to learn, which is something that you always um, um, see in me is I know when I'm not the expert at something. You, you want me to teach self-defense? I'm the expert at that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a, a lot of experience and a, a good uh, funda fundamental base knowledge of how to do that. But when it comes to racing, no clue. Been to a whole bunch of race car schools, for sure, but definitely not the expert. And rally is completely different. I mean, I've been to a lot of hard surface race car driving courses, but rally is different, man. That it's different on how you navigate the vehicle, the land navigation, um, the communication between co-driver and driver. It's fascinating. That's why I love it, and I'm so excited to do it. I'm bringing the whole team out there, um, out in Missouri. Um, for the ARA 100 Acre in the Woods. So stay tuned for that, and I'll be bringing a lot of content to you guys. I hope to kind of rig some kind of thing up where I could do live feed or at least get that thing uploaded real fast so you could track the experience with me. What is my motivation there? I don't know. I want to have fun. Uh, I want to get, get out and inspire people to do rad stuff, uh, live your best life. You know, one of the operational mission sets and, uh, for, for my company uh, one of the mission statements specifically for Philcraft proper, that's Philcraft survival. We do have another mission statement for training, um, but the mission statement for Philcraft survival has changed. It's to inspire, educate, and equip you to live your best life. What you do when you go outdoors, if, you, if you're operating the outdoors, is you are um, building resilience by exposure. It's really that simple. The more you get out, the more... You mildly suffer. I mean, we're not talking about climbing Mount Everest. I'm talking about, you don't know, going on a hike, going camping, spending time outdoors. Uh, the more resilient you could be. I mean, it's just a fact of life. I mean, we think about resilience as, man, this is crazy. I went out camping. I mean, you didn't spend 600 plus days on an ice cube like Shackleton's crew um, from the, uh, the Endurance, from the, the ship, the Endurance, when they got stranded in uh, Antarctica. So, man, it, it, it's a good way to build resilience, and we're on that train, man. And, and anything I could do to inspire you, um, I'm down for. If you're watching this on YouTube, um, last episode we were talking about AR-15s, and it's cool because I could pick up an AR and demonstrate to you. Um, I also have this on podcast because that's where it lives, all over the place, Spotify, iTunes, etc. cetera. Um, I got a couple things I want to cover today before we get to ARs, including the situation in Ukraine, because it's unfolding as we speak. Russia right now is going into Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and there's a whole bunch of things going on. Um, it's a lot to wrap your head around, especially when only getting glimpses of it and news that is biased, right? I mean, and they're, they're painting the picture via the narrative they want. I already saw uh, a lot of media outlets, especially on the left, paint the picture that inflation, all the price hikes that we're seeing, including at the gas pump, are caused because of Ukraine. Uh, no, that's not. That's called bad policy. 
In fact, Ukraine has probably been created by bad policy. When you have this situation where we are seen as weak across the globe. I mean, look, I don't care how you voted. I do care how you're going to vote in the future. You, maybe you thought Biden was the right solution, but now when you look at the complexity of foreign policy with somebody who's utterly, by all indications, by all evidence, and just looking brain dead, um, and, and, and I don't mean to say it facetiously because I think there's a serious is- issue there, including potential dementia. When you see that, how is it, on- how is it going to get better when it seems to only get worse? And so when you have foreign policy debacles like Afghanistan, um, like Hong Kong, like Russia, and um, man, bound to be Taiwan, this is going to be a significant issue on how the world sees us, but also how the world takes advantage of America in the future. Russia, importing-wise, imports the third largest amount of barrels. It's uh, 595,000 barrels, according to an article by Forbes magazine, looking at data in late 2021 behind Canada and Mexico. 595,000 barrels a day America receives from Russia. So when you just take that factor, I mean, you don't have to take the fact that Russia produces uh, more oil than almost every country besides the United States and Saudi Arabia, and then has a pipeline feeding Europe. Um, Just take into account that we receive 600,000 barrels a day And I think the estimate is if we are still running the Keystone Pipeline, which we have abandoned completely, uh, which includes our independence, right, from oil, we've abandoned completely, we would receive about 830,000 barrels a day, according to the estimates. So our policy, this has nothing to do with uh, anything other than policy affecting people's lives are going to lead to catastrophe, to catastrophe. So we have Keystone Pipeline shut down. So now we have more dependence on systems, including Saudi Arabia, Russia, the list goes on. And now we're in, uh, instituting sanctions that we threatened for weeks in advance, advertised openly to the world, including Russia, who had plenty of time to make adjustments. Because we're saying, We're going to freeze your bank accounts and all your assets. Well, what do you think the Russians are doing to avoid that? They're buying time. All they did the entire time they said, we will be willing to come to the table. Let's talk about diplomacy is they were buying time as we virtue signaled as a nation, how good of a job we are doing. I mean, right now, the White House and the administration thinks they're doing a good job and they're uh, they've executed All of the criteria based on the invasion of all the sanctions. Well, you're a day late and a dollar short. Because now, those assets that have been moved around have been moved around. Cryptocurrency is a a way the Kremlin is operating. How are you going to suppress that in a global economy? You're not. And who who are you sanctioning? I mean, you're sanctioning the Russian people? I mean, you're, you're, you're sanctioning the government... But the, the idea is it's going to hurt the Russian people. I mean, the Russian people live in sanction. It's called communism. So I don't think when it comes to like the sacrifice of them um, occupying Ukraine and their Soviet powerhouse legacy for the rest of history is hurting them. I mean, now they don't have, now we don't have a jumping point because we refused like all the NATO allies because of corruption, to bring Ukraine into the NATO alliance. So yeah, it feels good to virtue signal. It feels good to say, uh, with aggressive words, we're going to institute sanctions. And then you occupy Poland, and you occupy um, all the areas around Ukraine, but you don't do anything to help Ukraine. Ukraine just... Uh, issued martial law, and the estimates are around ten to 15,000 civilians that they armed. There was a video uh, by a news reporter 
uh, yesterday that I watched where a guy got two AK-47s and some ammo. And when asked if he knew how to use it, the answer was no. And we, we talk about this idea of the Second Amendment and what it means. It doesn't mean a gun so you can go shoot ducks on a pond. It doesn't mean the constitutional protection for you to take your AR and go shoot a three-gun match. What it does mean is that you have the right to bear arms to protect yourself and to protect this nation. Because that's what it's all about. Because right now, those 10,000 civilians, how many of them are going to be able to defend their country as freedom fighters? Russia is going to crush Ukraine. Like, don't be, don't be ill-advised. Even when I see Dan Crenshaw, like, they need to fight for their freedom. They're just going to die for their freedom. And, and how does that feel when the world literally abandons you? After propping it up and virtue signaling around the world that we're going to do this, we're going to protect. I mean, I, I've seen the videos. You don't, I'm, not, I'm not blowing smoke up your butt. This is like legitimate. Every world leader was like, we're going to protect Ukraine. We're going to do our best. And then when Russia started making moves, everybody started backpedaling, including the United States of America. What does it mean when you deploy a whole bunch of troops to all the neighboring countries that can't do anything about it when Russia invades? Now, I'm not advocating for war because here's what you don't want. You don't want a war with Russia. I promise you that. I promise you that. You do not want a war with Russia. They are a nuclear powerhouse, a nuclear powerhouse. By some guesstimates, by some reports, arming Ukraine with nuclear weapons, um, getting them to the NATO table would have set a precedent to be able to prevent this. This is back in the 90s, according to Ben Shapiro's last podcast. This took place back in the 90s and could, could have done something about it. Uh, I heard a report, too, about James Clapper. James Clapper was the director of national intelligence uh, in 2014 when I was a contractor for the Central Intelligence Agency. And the, uh, the IC, the intelligence community, includes, um, man, a lot of intel organizations, which with a lot of redundancy, by the way, the DIA, the NSA, the CIA, the list goes on. And it's 17 plus organizations. Last time I checked, could be more today because that's bureaucracy for you. Um, but when you look at that and, and you look at the DNI's response recently, Clapper, we should have done more about Ukraine. Well, hell, in hindsight, yeah, we should have done more, but we didn't. So what does it mean for us? Well, according to the press secretary, um, Jen Psaki, um, it's a sacrifice that we're going to have to make as a nation because we're standing here on principle. I'm paraphrasing there uh, here. But basically it said, hey, suck it up. American people, suck it up. We're already dealing with unprecedented crime. I mean, the New York City stats uh, just came out, which is the data, the, the data collected over the last year. And every major violent crime, including rape, a homicide, uh, is up 60 plus percent. And when you look at those statistics on top of mental health, drug overdoses, um, all of these significant issues we're facing because of the pandemic on top of bad policy, we're already suffering. So now when the gas is $10 a gallon, um, we have a finger to point because it's all the Russians fault. Is it? Or is it the administration's fault? I, I don't like to be political on these podcasts, but damn it. I know what incompetency looks like. I mean, this is like the worst foreign policy debacle I've ever experienced. And trust me, being under several presidents serving in the military and for the CIA uh, and seeing fraud, waste and abuse. This is the worst I've seen it. The worst. And you think it's going to be better? No, it's not. I mean, we're, we are literally targeting People who showed up to a protest as domestic terrorists that showed up, even people who didn't enter the Capitol building, which was stupid. I mean, just dumb 
But is that an insurrection? No, certainly not. Um, BLM, uh, who, by the way, nobody's reporting in the national media about all of the money that's missing, 60 plus million dollars that's gone. And the co-founder of BLM, who had three plus million dollars worth of real estate, and now nobody could find who's in charge or nobody could find. This is California threatening BLM that's um, sta- stationed and based out of California. No, nobody could find the $60 million plus dollars. California's going after them. But nobody's talking about the violent acts of real domestic terrorism, including burning down black communities, black business. Antifa, who shows up in uniforms, commanding and controlling violent actors attacking a federal courthouse or a federal building in Portland, Oregon, that continued to happen for years. Nobody went after them. What are we doing? Like, what the hell is happening in this country? It's alarming to me. It is blowing my mind. You know, some of the things that I I try not to do is fear monger because I don't want to capitalize on the things that are going on in the world. But like if my, my my theory has always been if you put down your cell phone and all your problems go away, well, you know, your problems, you know where they live in your virtual reality. But it's not like that anymore because a lot of this whack policy is affecting our culture, our communities and our lives directly without your cell phone. Critical race theory. What? Like, what? What? Like, you're teaching our kids critical race theory? You're over-sexualizing our children in schools? Like, what the hell is going on? Like, this debate in the education system between the left and the right where we are putting ourselves in a situation where we're allowing the government to dictate how we teach our children or what we teach our children. That's the parents' responsibility. Here's what I don't like. The right's just as bad. As an independent, I look and I go, what are these morons doing? I don't, like, the Republican Party doesn't represent me. They represent it closer than any other party. But when you have old-ass white dudes who have been politicians for 10, 20, 30 years that are commanding the same demanding the same amount of respect based on uh, broken promises and bad policy and not standing up for Americans, not the middle class, not impoverished uh, citizens, but they're not standing up for Americans. That is a problem. That is a problem. What is the answer here? Have no idea. No clue. Here's what I know. You better get more self-reliant. You better stop depending on the institutions. I had the opportunity to talk to um, some great human beings up in uh, Tahoe. Had a great time. Um, it was no excuses uh, dairy conference. And it had to do with uh, consultants who are nutritionists, uh, dairy farming experts and industry experts. Uh, 94% of dairy farms across America are family owned and operated. 94%. But we have... Uh, people, uh, industries attacking the dairy industry because it's bad to milk a cow. It's about to, bad to do anything. I mean, like this idea of shutting down the Keystone pipeline because uh, environment, uh, env- the environment. We, we are like 14% of the world's carbon emissions. 14%. 14%. Oh, did you know um, we need our independence? Now we're dependent on all of these nations and these powerhouses. And when the relationship falls apart, what are we going to do about it? It's like breaking up with your man and his CDs are in your truck. That's an old joke. But it's like we need to break and cut the umbilical cord. Screw your CDs. I'll throw them in the trash. I don't need them. So what are we doing with this this country to gain our independence? We're not prepared for anything. We're ill-prepared. I mean, the administration trying to make excuses over um, not having the stockpile of tests. When I got COVID for the third time, because I think I had Omicron and then the Delta afterwards, it was a real bad bout. I couldn't get a test. Nowhere. They're like, did you get a test? No, I can't get a test. Why? There's no test in stock. 
I can't get a test. I'm afraid for this country and the direction it's heading in every aspect. Crime, culture, policy, education, commerce. I mean, look at every single, like directly attributed to weak policy, to the weak presidency. It it just boggles my mind. March 1st, stay tuned for some, uh, stay tuned for a shit show. You want to see a shit show? Watch the State of the Union address. You want to see fiction? More more intense than uh, the Terminal List by Jack Carr? Pay attention to the uh, State of the Union address. Let's see how that works out. So what do I think is going to happen with Ukraine? Well, we better be careful. If Ukraine goes into Poland and we have any conflict there, we're looking at World War III. If, can you imagine right now if the Russians start carpet bombing Ukraine because of the insurgency or resistance that they're getting from the civilians who are willing to fight for the freedoms? God bless them. But can you imagine they start carpet bombing and then killing American citizens? Um, If you if you haven't heard, there was, again, not a non-combatant evacuation order for citizens, American citizens in Ukraine. They were told via an email, maybe a memo, you need to leave. But there's been no evacuation. So facilitating evacuation, haven't heard anything. So there's probably American citizens there. Can you imagine Russians killing American citizens? That's what we might be running into. And then the question is, what are we going to do about it? Nothing. Not a thing. We won't do anything. Nothing. So the only thing we're doing when we're sanctioning aggressively Russia with our dependence on other systems and institutions is hurting ourselves. That's what we're doing. Yeah, you think Europe is going to be happy I mean, German, uh, Germany had to be leveraged and, and convinced by titty twisting them to be able to uh, impose sanctions on Russia. Why? Well, a lot of those economies are desperately um, hooked up with Russia. So what are we doing? They're, they have plenty of allies they could sell oil to. You think we're hurting them? Uh, we shut down two of their banking systems and froze the assets. You think they don't have more assets? They could print that money like it's, they're communist. We're over here trying to become socialist. They're over there um, imposing communist will, and we're doing nothing about it. Nothing about it. Why is it even a news story if we're not doing anything about it? It's like Libya. What did we do? Nothing. Right? It's like, it's like Afghanistan. That lasted two weeks in the news cycle. I went to one of the brave Marines that lost her life in the suicide um, explosion that killed 13 brave Americans. What did we do about it? Nothing. We didn't do anything. You know what we did? You know what the administration did? The day after they launched a drone strike and killed a whole bunch of kids. They killed a guy who uh, worked with the United Nations. Yeah, and a whole bunch of kids. That's what we did. That's how incompetent we are right now. And where's the leadership? Where is the profound leadership stepping up no, nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. So what we need to do as individuals in this country is start leaning on building self-reliance on your own. That's uh, independency from banking systems and institutions. That's uh, starting your own business. That's uh, uh, looking at your grid and your circumstance and the dependency on that grid. That's looking at where you live. Because if you live in a communist state like California, you probably should leave and be somewhere that's not like that. Um, You should start making moves to protect, isolate, and be able to defend and thrive in your environment. I'm thriving in Utah. I love it here. I ain't never leaving. I'll have a ranch in Wyoming or Montana or Idaho, but I ain't leaving Utah. Why? Because it's great, loaded with a, a, a great Americans and great people. The place starts getting whack here. Oh, things are changing. I'll be the first to stand up and, and to do something about it. It's why we started American Contingency. Right before I transition, let's talk about American Contingency and what we got going on. AmericanContingency.com. We have 50,000 plus members, hundreds of groups, 
and membership is like five dollars a month. I get emails all the time from onesies and twosies of people like, you know, I'm not getting value out of this and I want my five dollars back. Well, you have your five dollars. Um, go spend it at Starbucks, go do your thing. Um, I don't want to be rude about this, but check it out. American contingency isn't about me providing value to you. It's about you providing value to your community. And we started the Philcraft Fund, which we're going to be start fundraising here, hopefully to do stuff with a, get to do stuff with Black Rifle Coffee Fund and build out a, a capital asset to be able to leverage the task organization of groups and people in American contingency to provide supplies, including catastrophe response for regions that are affected by natural and man-made disasters. We're already doing it. We just don't advertise it because we'll get blocked and shadow banned. According to a lot of these losers, I'm a uh, domestic terrorist because I want to help people uh, be self-empowered and less dependent on the government. I I'm not anti-government. I'm anti-dependence on the government. I think there should be less government. I want a president who comes in and has a plan to reduce the signature, the spending, the fraud, the waste, the abuse on all the government is doing. Because certainly having been, been a member of uh, serving in the government, uh, I've seen this. I was just talking to somebody about this the other day where you look at fiscal budgets, October to October for the federal government. I've been told literally in the most elite counterterrorism units in the world, go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars before October 1 or we'll lose the budget the following year. Is that fraud? No. Is it waste? Yeah. What are we doing? We're just spending and purging money on a whole bunch of dumb stuff. Take that money, reinvest it back into the country. That's what we need to be doing. Into the infrastructure. Reducing inflation. Empowering entrepreneurs. Right? That's what we need to be doing. But we're not. We're not. So, AmericanTendency.com. Go visit it. Um, and be prepared. I hope by the end of this year to have the regions, uh, the significant regions, the Southeast, the Northeast, I mean, significant regional groups, areas to be uh, facilitated with supplies. Depending on where it is, if you're in Florida region, Alabama, Georgia, um, you could be affected by hurricanes. So we'll have a stock uh, surplus of tools, of wood, of water, of food to be able to respond to a disaster. And we'll have that supply chain stockpiled with the vehicles prepped and ready to go. So when something happens, we can respond. If it's in Montana, it's looking at cold weather contingencies. So that's my objective with the Philcraft Fund is to be able to leverage those assets to help this country and stop depending on the government to do it. You'll be so much more effective and, and powerful as individuals, as private citizens, than you would ever be um, waiting on FEMA. You know, it's this idea of like, you are your own first response. Yeah, no crap. You are because by time first responders, brave first responders re, uh, respond, it's too late. With the crime statistics going through the roof all over, it's too late. So let's talk about uh, AR. I got I got some questions I want to get to because um, I promise you guys on the YouTube, if you're not subscribed, go to the YouTube channel. It's the Mike Force podcast on um, YouTube as well as Mike Glover Actual. And if you're not following Phil Kraft's Survival's channel, you should do that too. Uh, what's your thoughts on EOTech hollow sites? My main defense carbine is a 16-inch 1 and 9 AR that I bought and modified. Right now, it only has irons. I eventually want to swap out the barrel for budget concerns. I can't do it right now, so that's my setup. Since my defensive situation that I would most like encounter with that said weapon system would not uh, be at distance, I want an optic that could give a good sight picture, picture rapidly. That's coming from John Davis on YouTube. Big shout out. Look, um, John, EOTechs are great. Uh, I used EOTechs in my special operations career. Got a lot of experience with them. The problem is they're too damn heavy. And there's a lot of great optics out there, including from Aimpoint, the Micro T, uh, Leupold optics, um, Vortex optics, uh, even the new SIG optics that are light, 
uh, easy to use, and more inexpensive. I think the EOTech's a more ruggedized optic. Uh, I would weigh, like if you want the best bang for the buck, it's going to be an Aimpoint CCO or um, known as the M68 or the M2, the Comp M2. That They have a patrol optics or patrol rifle optic um, that you can get on Amazon for a few hundred bucks. That is, in the use of SOC and in Special Operations Command testing fared very well. I'd go with that. Save a couple hundred bucks, get something a little bit lighter, maybe less ruggedized, but it's not going to fail you. Those optics have been on my guns for years, and they never, never fail. Next question coming from Frank Kuzminski. Um, would love to hear your thoughts on the magazines. I know P mags are popular, but I got a bunch of GI and HK mags in the infantry days. Some aren't in great shape. I'd like to replace them. Um, so I'm looking at something more reliable and long lasting. Look, I, I have a, a good working relationship with Magpul. I would say that is the best magazines made. I used to be a big fan of aluminum magazines with green followers back in the day. But it's because they were light and readily available. One of the things you want to do is get an, a magazine that's readily available, um, that has withstood the test of time, that's durable, and that's going to be PMAX. Um, I get the newest variant of those, and I just stick with it, man. They're not too expensive. Um, I, I have HK mags laying around because I have a whole bunch of them for my contracting and active duty days. I just don't use them. They're too damn heavy. So P mags is the way to go. I'd also get a couple 20 rounders. You want some 20 rounders, especially if you're running like an SPR setup um, and you run like a bipod, which I do on my long SPR, my long barreled SPR. But yeah, go with, go with, uh, go with what works. Use the sock and SOCOM use uh, Magpul. That's what I, that's my choice. My first BCM, this is coming from uh, Kara was the Recce 11 KMR has been a rock solid platform. I could ne never locate a 12.5. This is some solid information. It's making me revisit some of my setups. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong, man, with a, um, anywhere from a 11, 12.5, or uh, I'm, I'm using 11.5s. Anything that's made from BCM, from Bravo Company, is going to be good, man. I, I haven't seen them fail. They're some of my favorite guns in the world. Go with that. Um, here is a question from Chris Tidwell. Find yourself in a situation with possible multiple shooters. How to determine which one is the bad guy or maybe all of them, but you don't know because you haven't seen the actual shooters. Don't know what that means. I'm going to move on. Mike, what about a 36 year old or uh, sorry, a 36 yard zero versus a 25. It shrinks the impact points of 25 to 300 by a couple inches. Is it worth it? Um, look, man, there's, at what I've realized over, over time that a lot of the considerations for zeroing a carbine institutionally, uh, even as individuals, has little to do with the intended objective or outcome. Like I, I zeroed 50 to 200 because of the ranges that I was involved in in special operations. When you look at a 36-yard zero versus a 25, one of the core uh, questions is what range are you using to zero? I mean, you one, if you have like a, a micro T that has a small red dot, you want to be able to use that red dot on a target and see your intended points of aim. What I mean is like, like, like say you have a one inch pasty at 25 yards. That's not easy to see on a paper target at 25 yards, naked eye, looking through an aim point optic or a red dot optic. It's not easy. So I would rather do that than push it to 36 or even 100 yards. I've seen departments try to zero on a 100-yard target. And it's like, what's your verification that you're zeroed? Are you putting rounds on the paper? And what's your point of aim? Because at 100 yards, if you're shooting a one-inch pasty and your dots, let's say it's 2.5 inches MOA it's still going to be an inch and a half bigger than the dot or uh, bigger than the pasty. So when you're trying to aim um, and, and get a good zero, even a bench rested gun, it's problematic. So I like the 25 to 300 zero. One, I could zero it in most ranges because most ranges have 25 meter um, 
var- or uh, variances. And I also like it that anything between 25 and 300 is nominal. I don't have to think about it. I just break the shot. I mean, when you look at the Army and the Army marksmanship um, qualification, to score expert, it's like 36 out of 40 to score expert with a rifle. Uh, there's a few 500-meter targets and a couple 400-meter targets, but the rest is like one to three, or even 25 yards. You don't have to think about it. You put the red dot where it's at and you break the shot. I like that. So I, I wouldn't get too wrapped around it. Um, now, if you're going out to seek distance, different considerations. All right, let's get to a couple more, and uh, I'll cut this a little short because um, I want you to be able to digest this on your commute. And likely, if it's more than 40 minutes, then you live in bum F Egypt. I'm in Honolulu and limited to 16 inches AR on an AR and no AR pistol. Uh, move. I'm um, just kidding. Honolulu is beautiful, but move. Seriously. My entry into the AR world is an LWRC, M6D, and burnt bronze with their furniture. Around the same time, I bought a BCM upper and 300 blackout, which I put on a Palmetto lower I built. My last one was a WMD builder set in nickel boron, uh, boron with a 13.7. Um, awesome. So that's, I don't think that's a question. Oh, he's got more. Read more. If shit hits the fan and I have to bug out, I'm grateful. I'm grabbing, sorry, I can't read. My eyes are bad. I'm grabbing my Gen 5 LWRC, um, my Gen 5 17. LWRC and 22 bolt down takedown and heading out. Otherwise, I'm going to bug in with my scar. Okay, this is just a comment. Uh, you got a lot of good setups. I mean, here's the problem with LWRC. I was a contractor when we started using LWRCs, and what I didn't like about them is they were super heavy. I mean, comparatively, gas piston to the MC, uh, 416, not, not much of a difference. But, dude, I like lightweight carbines. I like lightweight guns. I don't want to carry a bunch of weight. Um, here we go. Modern equivalent to the Winchester. Nope. Can you do a 308 AR-10 style setup, barrel length, brand optics, zero distance? Yes, sir. In fact, hopefully, um, I've already put it in an order for the SIG MCX. Um, is it MCX? I don't know. My brain's just glitching out right now. I need to get some coffee in me. Um, I put in an order for one. I do have a 308 LaRue OBR, but it's hella heavy. Back in the day, um, when I used to compete in the U.S. Army Special Operations Command sniper comp, um, I had um, John Noveski send me a Noveski 16-inch gun. And it fared really well in competition. I did really well. Um, the reason I wanted to go with the 16-inch gas gun, because it was a little bit lighter than the SR-25 variants that we had. And it was more accurate out the box. Sorry, Knight's Armament. It just was, was, was more accurate. Now I'm on this trip where it's like, if the gun's not light, I don't want it. I mean, the optic alone adds a lot of weight, but there's some good guns out there. Um, I picked up a, um, I mean, a SIG Cross lays like nothing, right? When you take a MCX even, it's super light compared to my little OBR. So I will do that. And um, thanks for that question. Um, Here we go. A lot of these are comments, guys. Sorry. Bear with me here. Uh... (laughs) <laughs> Some guy said, um, I hate to stop. I had to stop listening at California Highway Patrol. Big shout out to those guys. Find it hard to support California officials. They hate the Constitution. Uh, and somebody said, which is true. California Highway Patrol do not pass laws to sign bills. They just serve the community. Absolutely. Uh, you're going to get that on the YouTubes, which is funny. Um, could you please do a video on using only the front site backup with no rear? I pretty much get it, but listening to you talk through it, through things, is always a treasure trove for me. Yeah, you know what, man? Um, look, most of my guns are set up for teaching classes on flat ranges. So the ranges or the guns that I use when I'm rural 
which include um, uh, a one to eight or one to six variable optic vortex Leopold are my favorite. When I have those, you have a reticle in them. So you don't need a backup iron sight. So if I, if I think about my setup, um, the window on my gun, the window on my gun uh, in reference for a close proximity target is enough um, than having a, a front and rear sight that don't co-witness or, or mate with my optic, which would mean if I wanted to use a front and rear backup sight, again, you know, the alignment of the two is what I'm doing. I would have to remove the optic off the gun. And if you don't have a bad lever or a QD detached lever on your optic, which a lot of those uh, uh, levers are not very good or reliable at pinning uh, the optic to your uh, gun and not failing. I've seen some of them fail. So I want the ability to lock tight, attach with a uh, Allen key or a hex key the optic to my gun, which now means I would have to find a front sight that could literally be mated with my optic um, or to have to break off my optic off the gun, which is just silly. So the reason I run just a front backup iron sight, depending on what I'm doing, is because I could use the front to potentially mate with the ocular lens of the optic. And so now I have a point of reference to look through that see the front sight, and send it. Now, is it accurate at distance? No, of course not. But it's better than nothing as a backup. Um, and, and also, the technology, the durability of these optics, I haven't seen one fail. I have a micro T on my rifle that I have never seen fail. In combat, nine trips to war, um, a lot of years in training, I've never seen one of those optics fail. There's a reason why they go through the kind of the mill spec protocol of all this stuff. All right, last question. I want to keep it keep this around forty something minutes. Uh, here's a guy. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, here you go. Good question from Blake Forrest. What are your thoughts on having a five five six two two three setup and a three hundred blackout? Versus having a 5 to 6, 2 to 3, and a 300 blackout upper that share, share the same lower. Um, very good question, man. It depends. It's, for me, it's budget dependent. But I use weapon systems for the utility. Meaning, I put them where they're needed, and that's kind of where they live. Like I have a truck gun that's a 300 blackout BCM, folding stock. Just like I have a, a SIG Cross three or 6.5 Creedmoor with an optic that is standalone set up uh, for hunting. So my 300 blackout, I don't need to swap uppers. But the consideration is obviously the budget. If you need a budget or if you're on a budget, you, you, you need to have separate uh, uppers for different things, then certainly. And if you want to go like use it as a truck gun and then you swap it out, use it as AR, why not? It takes the same magazine. Um, uh, you can use the same lower. You just got to swap uppers. Um, I like having independent systems that are set up so I can have both. Um, often, my 300 blackout, I don't take out of my truck. I just keep it in the back because I don't want to take the... V it's, like, um, it's like offloading expensive things into your house. Like The more you do that the, and somebody sees it, the more likely statistically somebody's going to go, ooh, I want that, right? I'm not going to get my backpack, my low-vis bag... Um, and keep transferring it back and forth. So yeah, good question. Um, let's end it there, guys. Ukraine, I'll keep you guys updated as I get the information. Um, PhilCraftSurvival.com, Black Rifle Coffee, um, and lastly, The Wolf 21. I get, a, I get a lot of good testimonials about The Wolf 21. I'll show you guys on um, the YouTubes about Wolf 21. But Wolf 21 is a CBD, CBN company I started to focus on getting your best day's rest as well as getting your um, health and wellness together. So we have a new product coming out um, that's going to focus on natural caffeine, 
um, as well as CBG, which is kind of like a little upper, which I use from our tactical response uh, tincture that you could just drop in coffee. I love it. And then bed down has the combination of CBD, CBN, uh, which has gotten me the best night's sleep I've ever had. Um, big shout out for partner company Slumber giving me the opportunity. TheWolf21.com uh, wouldn't lead you astray. I mean, if you read the testimonials, you can find it on the Wolf 21 on Instagram as well. Um, all good stuff. Like it changes people's lives, guys. And it's not Big Pharma. It's not Trazodone. It's not Ambien. It's not NyQuil. It's not alcohol. It's natural CBD, CBN. All right, guys. Till next time, I appreciate you. Like, subscribe. Uh, make sure you leave me feedback too on the podcast. Um, leave that rating on podcast. It just helps in the algorithm. Uh, and I want to say um, I appreciate you. Till next time. Peace.